Hey everyone, it's Dale. And one really important thing we need to talk about before the end of the semester is media law. So we touched on ethics uh, yesterday, um, but I need to also give you a primer as you uh, prepare to move on with your uh, journalism studies and talk about media law. Now you'll have an entire class on this. Uh, most students take it their senior year, uh, but this is just a, a brief introduction to some of the most important uh, legal aspects of the journalism field. Um, so when we talk about media law, a lot of it is framed on the First Amendment, which contains five different freedoms. Uh, you probably immediately think of freedom of speech when you think of the First Amendment. Uh, but there are four others. So freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of petition, and then the one that uh, we deal with in journalism, which is freedom of the press. Uh, so five freedoms in the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of petition, and the freedom of the press. Uh, so when we talk about freedom of the press, our rights as journalists fall into two main categories. The first is privileges and protections. So we'll talk about that. And then the second is access to government operations. So um, let's take a look at those individually. Um, some of the particular privileges or protections of the press. The first one is the fair report privilege. And what this states is that it allows journalists to report anything being said in official government proceedings without being sued or censored, no matter how slanderous or defamatory the facts or quotes might be. The big thing with this is that all reporting must be fair and accurate. So why do you think this is important? Um, let's put this in a scenario. Let's say you're covering a city council and one of the city council members who is a male uh, gets up and calls a female city council member a slut. Um, if you report on that, that male city council member cannot sue you uh, because uh, what he said or what you reported, as long as it is fair and accurate, as long as you didn't take him out of context, uh, as long as you know if he wasn't quoting someone and said the word slut and you misheard it and thought he was calling the female city council member one, as long as your reporting is fair and accurate, we're protected under the fair report privilege. So you can see why this would be very important because it allows us to truly uh, report on what is being said and what is happening at public meetings. So that's the fair report privilege. Um, there's also the opinion privilege, which is uh, it protects opinions. So I say they're usually negative because nobody would be fighting positive opinions, right? Uh, protects opinions from libel, uh, protects defamatory statements as long as they are, are true. Um, the crucial distinction here is between what is a fact and what is a opinion. So I have a couple of examples there on the screen. Uh, if you're writing that someone is a thief, you better have facts to back that up. You better have a police report. Uh, you better have a conviction more than, more so than a police report. Uh, or, you know, police saying the person is a thief, so you there use attribution. Uh, writing that someone is the worst coach ever, that's an opinion now at that point. Um, so it's covered under the opinion privilege. Um, we also have fair comment and criticism, uh, which is very similar to the opinion privilege. This allows us to criticize politicians in the news. Um, and then we have uh, freedom from newsroom searches. So this, uh, the Privacy Protection Act, uh, keeps the government from coming into a newsroom and demanding um, to see notes, files, stuff like that. Now, the only time this doesn't apply is if a journalist is actually involved with a crime. Uh, therefore, if that's the case, the police can come in and do pretty much whatever they want with your records as long as they get a subpoena. Um, if they think you're about to destroy evidence or when somebody is about to be hurt. So... Um, there are some exceptions to that Privacy Protection Act, uh, but for the most part, it protects the government from coming in and searching newsrooms. Um, another incidence or uh, thing to consider when it comes to privileges and protections of the press, is something called a shield law. You may have heard about this before, but what a shield law does, it protects reporters from having to reveal confidential sources and or notes. Um, 49 states and Washington, D.C. either have a shield law or some sort of protection. Texas is one of those states. The problem with shield laws is they're pretty weak. 
Um, so most journalists and like the society of professional journalists, um, are fighting for stronger laws, stronger shield laws, uh, because most of the times the shield laws have very little effect, uh, if they ever get called on in court. Um, there are no, there is no federal shield law. So that is one thing some people are calling for and reporters have gone to jail to protect sources. So, um, even though there is a shield law, reporters have been subpoenaed in court and ordered to give the name of their source and they say no. And, um, doesn't matter that there was a shield law, uh, they've gone ahead and gone to jail. So, uh, again, you see they're, they're kind of weak. They're not very strong, uh, but they are there in certain instances to protect journalists. Um, and then the other aspect of freedom of the press is access. So a couple of different things that are really important with this, uh, one is freedom of information. So the public has a right to know what the government is doing. And this uh, happens in different ways. Uh, one is that we're supposed to allow or we're supposed to be allowed access to courtrooms. So the Supreme Court has ruled that most trials are open unless there's some type of major thing that demands that it be closed. Um, so most local trials will be open. There are some instances where trials are closed. Uh, so military trials, you can't get in there. Uh, grand jury testimony, we're not allowed in there. They give us the results after. And even though it's not a trial per se, um, the Supreme Court does not allow uh, cameras inside the Supreme Court as well. Um, and you actually aren't allowed in the Supreme Court. Uh, in that sense, some courts don't allow cameras and or tweeting, which that's still something being worked out in a lot of the courts. Reporters actually tweeting from, uh, you know, the the stands there. Um, this is changing. A lot of courts are realizing that, um, it's just a simple extension of reporting. Uh, but for instance, federal courts won't allow cameras inside. So that's why anytime you see a federal case in the news, it's always the sketches of what's going on. Um, so for the most part, courtrooms are to be open. Uh, meetings, public meetings are also supposed to be open. So anytime it's something that is being funded by tax money, uh, the open meeting laws say that they should be open. So this is local government, state government, uh, federal government, uh, committees, uh, school boards, stuff like that. They should be open. Um, this does vary state for state, but for instance, uh, school boards in particular, city councils, uh, they do have open meetings. They have to notify the media of the meeting uh, since the media are usually supposed to be there as representatives of the people, um, they'll also have notices where people can come and attend the meetings. Uh, sometimes these do go into executive sessions where they're um, either handling very sensitive topics or usually it's when they're hiring and firing people. They'll go into executive sessions, so they do that behind closed doors, uh, but the majority of the meeting will be out in the open. And then finally, when we talk about freedom of information, the first thing that comes to a lot of journalists' mind is the Freedom of Information Act. This is also called a FOIA, so F-O-I-A, FOIA. Um, most federal agencies have, well, all federal agencies have records um, that they keep, obviously. Um, and even this is also state, local, it can be just about anything. But reporters can file a FOIA request and most of those records can then be turned over to the journalist um, based on their FOIA request. Um, it depends on what it is you're requesting. If you're requesting something very nondescript, you might get it in a day or two. If you're requesting something that is incredibly um, shaming or uh, dangerous or something like that, it could take months and a lot of uh, headaches to get those documents turned over. Uh, you may have seen in the news today that some of Hillary Clinton's emails were turned over. Uh, reporters have been fighting for those for months and finally got some of them today. So FOIAs, Freedom of Information Act, very important. These are requests that reporters, journalists make to get records from government. Um, libel is, uh, when you talk about something that we have to be careful of in news, uh, libel is right up there at the top. Uh, libel is the publication and publication means anything that means on TV. That means, uh, radio. It means in the newspaper, on Twitter, on Facebook, 
Libel is the publication of a false statement that deliberately or carelessly damages someone's reputation. So it all comes down to defamation here. Um, anyone can sue for libel um, and businesses can also be defamed. So uh, your biggest defense is to tell the truth. So what constitutes libel? There are actually five criteria that must be met. All five of these criteria must be met for it to actually be libel. First thing is the statement must be false. So if the statement that you're saying is true, it's not libel. Um, so the statement must be false. It must also be defamatory. So it needs to be negative or put the person in a bad light. The statement must be published. Again, that's anything from print, TV, radio, web, Twitter, Facebook. I don't care if it's out there and put on something, then it's published. The plaintiff must be identifiable. Um, people have to know the person you're talking about. Um, you must identify the person you're talking about. And then the journalist has to be at fault. So the, the journalist just got it wrong. Um, so if all five of those are met, then it's considered libel at that part. Um, but libel doesn't apply in a lot of cases to celebrities. Um, so celebrities have to prove an extra step so if you or I went to sue for libel, we would just have to meet these five uh, conditions here. Um, if a celebrity goes to sue for libel, they must prove there was something called actual malice. Uh, actual malice kind of sounds weird. It might sound like evil, uh, which might actually be the case. But in the eyes of the law, actual malice means that the journalist knew they were lying. So it can't just be the journalist screwed up and got a story wrong. It has to be that the journalist made a point to get the story wrong, knew the information was wrong, went with it anyway, so knew they were lying, uh, and went with it. So it meets those five uh, categories, and then it has to be proven actual malice for a celebrity to win a, uh, a libel case. So that's why a lot of the cases when you see celebrities suing the tabloids, um, they'll sue them for just about anything. Um, they usually end up settling out of court. Uh, so a lot of these don't end up going to trial. Um, you know, it's usually a win-win for the tabloid actually, because tabloid gets some publication. Um, you know, they pay a couple hundred thousand dollars to a charity of the celebrity and they move on to the next one they do. Uh, but it's really hard for famous people to sue for libel. Um, so how can you defend or how can you prevent libel? Uh, like I said, the easiest way is to just tell the truth, to get your stories correct all the time. So to win a libel case, someone must prove that what you reported was false. So being able to prove what you reported was true, that is your ultimate uh, defense. Um, consent is also a uh, defense against libel. So if someone allows you to publish uh, something about them, they can't come back later and sue. So if somebody gives you a real uh, salacious quote, um, they can't come back later and say, hey, you couldn't do that. Um, you weren't allowed to publish that. It made me look bad. Um, they can't do that. And then privilege. So again, remember that fair report privilege and opinion privileges, those will protect you against libel in some cases. Um, so again, Ways to avoid libel. Verify all material before it's reported. Get your facts straight. If a story will likely offend or damage someone, give them a chance to comment. Um, so make sure you're reaching out to them. Words like allegedly or reportedly offer no protection. You hear them all the time in the news, particularly on TV news. They mean nothing. So they do not protect you against libel. And if you make a mistake, correct it. Apologize. Uh, as quickly as possible. Don't sit on it, issue a correction and an apology. Um, William DeFord is a famous libel attorney. Here's what he has to say is the best advice for reporters. Be sure of your facts. Remember that when you make a statement that might be considered damaging, um, you must not only believe it or even know it, but you also, you, I'm sorry, you must also be able to prove it. Remember that they say, or even that some authority said is not sufficient proof and that the publication of libel as a rumor does not make it less of a libel. So again, the ultimate defense in a libel case is that what you are saying is true and that you can prove what you are saying is true. Um, copyright is also a major uh, issue within media law. Um, here's the definition of copyright. 
Copyright is a government approved protection for all forms of creative expression, stories, books, images, songs, web pages, etc. A copyright legally establishes who owns a creative work and thus who controls its sale and reproduction. So uh, you hear about copyright a lot in music with images. So if you pull an image off Google image search and put it in one of your stories, uh, you have uh, you have done copyright. You have uh, violated copyright law at that point. So that's why we always stress on taking your own images anytime we have a story like that. Um, but we're mainly talking about like printed work in our field. Um, so here's a scenario. Let's say that Hillary Clinton is coming to Texas State to promote her new book or her recent book, Hard Choices. Um, of course, Hillary is the leading uh, front runner for the Democratic nomination. So we're going out and reporting as the university star covering Hillary Clinton's uh, appearance here at Texas State. So the question you have to ask yourself in the newsroom, uh, can you print portions of the book in your story? Can you print the juiciest portions of your book in your story? So uh, these are questions that are asked. How much is enough? How much is too much? And what is the right part uh, that I can publish? So here are the answers to that. Um, the safest thing to do in that scenario is to write Clinton or her publishing company and ask if you can run an excerpt from the book. Uh, chances are you're probably not going to hear back from them, but if you do, great. Either they say yes or no. Um, so let's say they don't get back to you. Uh, we do have something called fair use, uh, which means that if something is newsworthy, journalists are allowed to use part of it under the fair use rule. So uh, Hillary Clinton being on campus is newsworthy. Therefore, the book is newsworthy. So we can use part of it under fair use. And the only problem with that is there are no hard and fast rules it's really a judgment call, but here are some guidelines that you normally can go by. If you use a sentence or two in the book, you're just straight up, you know, quoting the book and attributing it to the book, um, but you're using the exact words, a sentence or two, you're probably safe. You're probably fairly safe at that. If you take a paragraph, you may be okay. If you take two to three paragraphs, you're really pushing it at that point. You're asking for someone to file a copyright claim on that. Um, and what's really important with fair use is you cannot diminish the value of the work. So that means you can't take that juiciest passage of the book and put it in your story because then that is going to hurt sales of the book if you've given away the most interesting part of it. Uh, a couple other things when it comes to fair use. Always credit the original source. So this does not mean plagiarism where you're using it and putting it off as your own work. No, you're taking a part of the book, you're crediting that source, and then again, you can probably get away with one sentence or two in a story. Um, also, letting readers know where they can purchase the book would show that, hey, I'm, I'm doing this with good intention. Um, so including, you know, parts of, you know, that the book is available on Amazon or at the Texas State Bookstore or something like that in your story might be a nice goodwill gesture to the publishing house to say, hey, look, I'm I come in peace. Right. Um, so keep those in mind when we're working on um, potential copyright cases. The last thing I want to mention when we talk about media law and ethics is the Society of Professional Journalism has its own code of ethics. Um, these are things that all journalists should be doing. There are four main parts. The first is seek truth and report it. So journalists should be honest, fair, and courageous in gathering, reporting, and interpreting information. So again, it all comes down to getting the story right. Uh, two is that we should minimize harm. So ethical journalists treat sources, subjects, and colleagues as human beings deserving of respect. Um, this doesn't mean we don't go after people. We don't go after the big guy or the bad guy. But when we do, we treat everyone with respect uh, so that we minimize harm on lives. Uh, three, we act independently. Journalists should be free of obligation to any interest other than the public's right to know. So this is where those conflicts of interest come into play. We act independently. And then finally, four is we are accountable. Journalists are accountable to their readers, their listeners, their viewers, and each other's. Um, so some really important stuff in this. 
uh, First Amendment. I would highly recommend you know the uh, the five freedoms under it. Um, know the privileges and protections. Be able to explain copyright. Understand libel. Uh, some really important part of this class. Uh, and unfortunately, we didn't have a ton of time to talk about this in class. Uh, for more information on this, read Chapter 7 in your textbook. I'd highly recommend doing that before our final exam. And then, of course, like I said, you'll cover all of this in a lot of detail uh, coming up later in the Media Law class.